Welcome to the Kentucky Derby edition of the Time Form U.S. Forecast. I'm David Aragona here with my usual co-host Craig Wilkowski, and it's a pretty exciting week in racing. Derby week is always a time that's really fraught with anticipation, and we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon. We've still got, uh, what, four days until the race, but uh, the 20-horse field was drawn yesterday, so the post positions are set, morning line is set, uh, a lot of debate happening now about handicapping and the pace. There are three runners drawn on the also eligible. List. I think we have to mention that after what happened last year with Rich Strike getting into the race to ultimately win. And Craig and I will talk about all 23 of those runners that have been entered for the Kentucky Derby on this podcast. This is just going to be a podcast that is solely focused on the Kentucky Derby, and we're going to do a real deep dive into the race now that we finally have the entries, just going through the field and post position order, and also talking about the pace situation. And Craig, I don't know about you, but I had a lot of fun handicapping this derby. It's one of those years where I don't think there's a real standout on form or speed figures. There are cases to be made for a lot of horses, and I went in actually liking a lot of different horses and found it to be fun to actually choose which ones I was ultimately going to land on. Yeah, it's a lot of years that can narrow it down to to two, three, four horses I really like. I I think that was a lot harder to do this year. Uh, I know we both had to send in our picks for the print edition of the Daily Racing Forum uh, this morning. And I, so I had to narrow it down to four, but it, it was tough to do. And um, some of the ones I cut, I wouldn't be shocked in the least if they were able to win. And we, as with most things, we don't know what the odds are going to be. And I tried to guess what they are for my selections, because even though it's a derby, I still do think you want to look for some value, though the one upside of the derby is almost no matter who you bet, I think you're going to get it unless you wind up on the the same favorite that Mattress Mac is going to bet millions on probably. Yeah, there's been some debate about what prices certain horses are going to be, and I guess we'll talk about that as we start to go through the field in this race. Uh, the morning line came out yesterday. I think there were initially some errors on the line, and uh, I'll, I'll just state that here. Some of those horses that uh, were 15 to 1 that people were kind of scratching their heads about are actually supposed to be 50 to 1, and you can see that in the PPs. So uh, I mean, from that perspective, I think uh, that makes a little more sense. Uh, but uh, I did make my own line for this race for the Daily Racing Forum, doing that derby watch with Brad Free. I've kind of been tracking my preliminary line with these horses all the way through the Kentucky Derby Trail. And I didn't change my line too much from last week right before the draw. A couple horses I tweaked after the post position draw and also with uh, one more that was not in the race last week getting into the race. Uh, But uh, things mostly stayed the same for me. And uh, we'll talk about some of the differences I had there with the track morning line as we go through this field. But Craig, before we get to the main contenders, we should probably talk a little bit more about the pace situation in this Derby because I think that's one of the most debated factors heading into this race. Just seems very murky. Throughout the Derby Trail, we didn't see too many confirmed frontrunners emerging, or at least emerging enough to have success enough to get into the Kentucky Derby field. So a lot of horses that maybe led once in one of their prep races, but were stalkers or coming from off the pace on other occasions. A lot of changing of running styles with a lot of these contenders moving into the race. So it still remains pretty unclear who's going to go forward forward and it seems like the kind of race where jockey intention uh connections drawing up the plan on paper beforehand and also the start could have a major impact in how this pace plays out definitely could it's a weird race when you look at the preview page on time form us we're listing 23 horses currently and only one of those horses is listed as a leader or a speed horse And that's a number two verifying. And he's a horse who hasn't really led a race early since his debut at six furlongs. He's been close up uh, within a length, a length and a half in his last three starts. So I wouldn't argue with anyone who says he's going to be the leader, but I I don't think it's a given. And and I think it's a pretty tough race to get a handle on. Uh, Similar to last year, we added the Japanese horses, the Japanese shippers to the uh, pace projector, uh, Derma Sodagake and um, Continuar. And... Uh, Similar to last year, the leader is one of those Japanese horses, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. It's not one of those things where I just saw the Japanese horses led last year, so I was biased to put them there. I did the same exact exercise I did last year where I just rated the two off of the UAE Derby run at Maidan, and... I actually was pretty conservative with it. Um, I used for a speed figure the time form rating, 
and, and kind of use the fractions to go with that. And it still made him fast enough to uh, show Derma Sotagake on the lead. So it's one I didn't really have a lot of question about. Now, it is just based on one race. I know you've posted some of his replays in the past on Twitter, and it's not like he's a need to lead or even a horse who'd really run on the lead before Dubai, but that's the one race we used, and he was successful doing it, so I do think he's going to be a pretty strong pace presence in here. Yeah, it's an interesting discussion point how they're going to ride Derma Sotagake in this race. And obviously what Craig is referring to there is uh, the Timeform US pace projector. And uh, if you don't have access to the Timeform US PPs, I mean, uh, what are you waiting for? But also, uh, I did tweet out a graphic of the Timeform US pace projector for you want to uh, follow along while we talk about it here. Uh, but uh, yeah, he is shown on the front end here, Craig. And like you're saying, it's one of those situations where he probably looks like more of a confirmed front runner just a base on that UAE Derby compared to some others in here. But if you take into account his other races, including those starts in Japan from last year, he was a horse that showed a very versatile running style coming from off the pace on occasion. And he probably would have pace figures that look a lot more like others in this field if we took into account those races as well. Uh, but uh, based on uh, the, the data that we have from the UAE Derby, uh, he is shown on the lead here. And, you know, Craig, the pace projector, it does not factor in post position position. And maybe that's something that we should look at in the future for a 20 horse field, but it's such a rare situation when we get that only really the Kentucky Derby. Uh, it, it's hard to really uh, build a, a scenario around that, uh, just a small sample size. Uh, but I, I know some people express some skepticism that a horse could get to the lead from post 17. You kind of have to run in that diagonal to get over to the first turn. So you generally see more horses from the inside show more aggression. And that also makes sense because connections that draw inside post positions, I think they have more of an impetus to ride aggressively from the gate because you don't want to get caught in that kickback, that crush of horses coming over on you heading into the first turn. So I won't be surprised if some horses like verifying the number two or the number four confidence game, especially, and, and even uh, the number seven reincarnate, a horse that I think a lot of people expect to be forward in this race, get more aggressive rides than Derma Sotagake. Yeah, you pretty much just nailed the horses that I think are likely to contend for the lead. I would be very surprised if it's not one of those four in this, even in a field as big as this. I mean, we show a few others up fairly close. Rocket Ken is shown in fifth. He's not really a horse who has shown a whole lot of early speed in his career. I, I've heard people mention Jace's Road as a likely front runner. And for me, I, I just don't see that one. I mean, he wasn't fast enough in one of the slowest paced races that you're ever going to see in a last round derby prep in the Louisiana Derby. Uh, not that he wasn't fast enough. He just wasn't asked to go. And when you look at his PPs, he just hasn't really been in any races with a quick pace. So I think it would be asking a lot of him to get up there and... Outside of that, um, maybe Kings Barnes, you could argue, because he went wire to wire in that Louisiana Derby. But I think that was more of a pace situation when you look at his first two starts, which were uh, both a mile or longer. He was more off the pace when it was a more reasonable pace. So I, I would stick to one of those four is going to be the leader. And I think a lot of it's going to have to is going to come down to just how determined the rider is to get to the front end. Yeah, I think you've got to be a little bit careful in some of those slow-paced final preps uh, because uh, uh, horses tend to have a lot more speed than they're asked to show in the early quarter of those races going two turns. You know, I think of a situation like with Maximum Security where he was further back on the pace projector due to, due to a very slow-paced victory in the uh, Florida Derby in his final prep. But Maximum Security was a horse that had shown a lot of speed in his sprint races and his one-turn races prior to stretching out. Out, and that's not really the case with horses like Kings Barnes and Jace's Road. Even in the recent preps prior to the Louisiana Derby, they just haven't shown the kind of speed that says to me that they're going to be quick enough to get forward in this race. And I've seen each of their connections, Todd Pletcher and especially Florent Giroux, the rider of Jace's Road, say that you know it's their intention to be forward. I think Florent Giroux said he, in his pace handicapping of the race, he's the only speed in the race. Well, I, I think a lot of connections might get that idea in their head that they can be the speed if they want to be the speed. And sometimes these situations where it looks a little murky on paper, a lot of different trainers and jockeys get this notion that they can be forward and these paces can sometimes be a lot more competitive than they look on paper. 
And that's why I want to mention probably the last thing I, I really have on pace is why we almost always, I think every year that we've done this, have had the fast pace flag on the Kentucky Derby. And even in a race this year where there's just not a lot of true speed horses, natural front runners, there are so many horses with tactical speed. It's almost impossible to think that at least a few of them aren't going to try to go. That's always what seems to happen. All of the derbies that I can remember have had at least one or two of the fractions coated in red, which means fast for a typical 10 furlong race. It doesn't mean it's fast for a typical Kentucky Derby, but the Kentucky Derby isn't a typical race, and they generally go faster than what's ideal because you have to get position and try to avoid trouble. So it's just not your usual race. And uh, speaking of the fast pace situation and uh, why we're predicting that, there is always that possibility in the Derby that you could have a horse clunking along from far back in the pack to get a piece of it, sometimes a big piece of it. And Craig, I know you wanted to mention uh, Rich Strike from last year. He was the horse who had the highest late pace rating in the race. And that's something that you do want to pay attention to any time that you've got a fast pace situation in time form U.S. Yeah, I always tell people, like particularly those that play handicapping contests that use Timeform US, where I know you have to have big prices often if you're going to win. One of the best scenarios is fast-paced races with big late pace figures from from bombs, horses that don't really figure on paper. Um, I wasn't smart enough to come up with Rich Strike last year. Didn't we didn't really talk about him because he was on the AE list at the time? But it's not like I would have picked him to win. But it's one of those that just kind of reminded me. It, it's an angle that I like to use in these uh, races, and that's why you get upset sometimes, like a horse like Giacomo and a. Uh, um, Orb wasn't an upset, but he was a favorite who came from way back in, in both uh, the last the race last year. They all had pace figures in the 160s uh, early, which just sets it up for an off the pace runner. Now, it is kind of dependent that you get a good trip in these races, even if you're a deep closer. Oftentimes that run is muted uh, by the fact that, you know, they just can't get a clean trip, lose ground, get stopped, whatever. So it's always a dicey situation with that. But in this particular race, by far the best late pace horse is Skinner. It doesn't often happen that we have a big a gap as we do in here. He has the top late pace rating of a 117. It's uh, way back to Sun Thunder. I say way back, a 109. The, the point scale is a little bit more spread out than this is for speed figures. I would say that eight points is probably a length and a half to two lengths, but still a pretty sizable margin, bigger, bigger than what we usually see in a race like this. Yeah, Craig, and while Rich Strike winning the race from as far back as he did might be somewhat of an anomaly over the past few years, I mean, you know, you mentioned Orb, who did it before that. I mean, often the, the pace does not fall apart enough for a horse to come from last to first in the Derby, but you do get a lot of those horses clunking up, as you said, for minor awards. You, you generally want to include one of those deep closers in your trifecta or superfecta in the Derby, so I think it's good to be aware of those horses. And when you're looking at the pace projector, we should just mention, you'll notice that you don't see that number nine chiclet for Skinner with the late pace flag. And, and I like that we've added that late pace flag in the new version of Time Form US that you can check out on DRF.com. Uh, but that's because they're shown off the screen. There are three horses that uh, just didn't have early pace ratings high enough to be shown in the Time Form US pace projector graphic. Uh, those are Skinner, Sun Thunder, and Angel of Empire. Um, I believe in order towards the back, they would be Angel of Empire 18th, uh, Skinner 19th, and Sun Thunder 20th. Uh, so just something to be aware of, but Skinner would be the one, as Craig said, that gets that late pace flag. And we should also just mention, based on what happened last year, if Mandarin Hero gets those two defections and draws into the race, he would have the second highest late pace rating, actually pretty close to Skinner. So just something to uh, to be aware of if there are some defections from this race later in the week. Well, Craig, I think we covered the pace situation pretty comprehensively. So let's go into the contenders. And as I said at the top, we're just going to take this field in post position order. We're going to go through each runner in the field, kind of do a deep dive into their PPs, discuss them, and then move on. And when we get to the end, I guess Craig and I will... Uh, 
uh, reward our podcast listeners who made it that far and give our picks in the race. Uh, you should also watch uh, the Derby preview video that we'll, we'll be recording later in the week when we also uh, use some more of the time from USPPs to handicap. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll discuss our picks towards the end of this. But first, let's go through this entire field, Greg. And we're going to begin with 104 Brad Cox trainees in the race. The number one hit show drawn down towards the inside. Actually, Brad Cox has two horses drawn closest to the rail in this race. But hit show uh, is a horse that's coming off a second place finish as the favorite in the Wood Memorial last time. Was a, a narrow loser of that race, just coming out of the wrong end of a head bob after a lot of bumping in mid stretch there. And I guess one thing you can say about hit show is that he has been short prices in every start of his career, I think favored every single time. And he's actually going to be a nice price in this race. Yeah, he's 30 to one on the morning line. And I would imagine you're going to get every bit of that. Uh, he comes in in obviously good form. Uh, he's only had one race where he didn't run particularly well at Churchill as a two year old. Uh, all of his races this year have been good. I think you do have to question the quality of that Wood Memorial. Um, he regressed on his speed figure four points off of his win in the Withers. Uh, maybe you could give an excuse due to the trip he had. He was wide around both turns, particularly the first turn. Uh, the bumping in the stretch. So he he is one I would say is probably moving in the right direction, is going to run a career top figure. I would be surprised if he didn't, uh, if he shows up for with his A race. I do worry about that inside post draw. He's a horse who has kind of tactical speed. He usually comes from off the pace, but it's not like he comes from way off the pace. He's usually within two, three, four lengths uh, going down the backside. So He's one, I guess, if you think the race is going to fall apart and he can work out a trip, uh, there's worse long shots in the field, that's for sure. Yeah, I would agree with that. And what I'll say about his placement on the pace projector, you mentioned he's a horse that's shown some tactical speed in the past. And I think if you look at the pace projector, he's all the way back in, I think, 16th out of 20. Um, and I kind of would expect him to be around there because you have to imagine Brad Cox has four runners in this race. Two of them have speed. He's probably going to be looking to take some of the others back and especially breaking from the rail rather than even trying to go forward. Often the best strategy from the inside is to just take back, try to to save some ground and get lucky and he seems like the kind of horse that should be getting that kind of trip from Manny Franco just not really even try to be forward in this race and maybe pick up the pieces at the end arguably there are some others with better finishing speed than he has but if he can get lucky and save ground he's a horse that I could see getting into the mix because as you said at least his speed figures have generally been trending in the right direction and he doesn't strike me as a horse that's going to have any problem with distance. Yeah, I agree. And I, I know a lot of people are down on the rail. I think the rail is more of a tougher spot if you're a speed horse. He's not. I, I would. I actually think he'll be a little bit closer just because of having that advantage of being on the rail. He doesn't have to be urged. It just depends how, face the, how fast the pace breaks out to see how far he gets shuffled back. But for him, I don't think the rail is a negative. To his outside is another Brad Cox trainee, verifying, drawn in the two hole. And Craig, you know, this is a horse that just based purely on speed figures, I mean, he fits in this race. He's coming off a neck loss to tap at Trice last time, who a lot of horses considered to be, a lot of uh, handicappers considered to be one of the top contenders in this race. He had that uh, much publicized unlucky trip to back in the Rebel and was an impressive allowance winner prior to that. So there's not too much to knock about Verifying's form. I just get the sense that he's a horse that has gotten very good trips when he's been successful. I wonder what kind of trip he's going to work out in this derby. I also wonder if 10 furlongs is really what he wants. So even though I respect his form, I just have questions about whether this is the right scenario for him. Yeah, you covered a, a lot of the concerns I have about him. One is that inside draw, he's almost going to have to go because when you give a really close look to his past performances, his two wins have come virtually wire to wire. I mean, one, he was pressing just off the pace. The uh, other, he was on the lead going just six furlongs. But all of his other races, when he isn't able to win, he's actually losing ground in the stretch. And to me, that's just not a good sign for a horse trying to go a distance further than he ever has, particularly when it's, in my opinion, not likely he's going to get a very easy lead. 
Yeah, and I'll be interested to see how he gets bet in this race. I mean, I suppose if he's drifting upwards of 20 to 1, you might want to consider a horse like him. I think I have him at 20 to 1 on my line, just thinking that some people might downgrade him for all of those reasons that we laid out, uh, that he might not get the right, right kind of trip from that post position. And given the kind of speed figures he's earned, I get it, but he's verifying is just not really for me in this race for, uh, for, for all the reasons that we've just laid out. Number three is two fills, Craig, and he's coming in off the co-highest last speed figure in the field. When you look at the races, the race in the uh, time form USPP is with the weight adjustment on. I believe he and Practical Move have the co-highest 120 time form US speed figure coming into this race. However, two fills earned that number on the Tapita synthetic course at Turfway last time, the Jeff Ruby Stakes. So what are we supposed to make of that? That's uh, the $64,000 question, I think, is how much uh, impact do you give that big speed figure last time? Um, his dirt races obviously weren't nearly as good. Uh, he ran okay in the Risen Star. He ran a 106 speed figure that day. And I think you could definitely upgrade that number. I know we've talked about it based on the trip. But it's still a pretty big jump to a 120. And I think the truth lies somewhere in between. Watching that race, I've watched it several times. To me, he looks like a horse who absolutely loved the synthetic. So if I had to pick one direction or the other to lean, it's that that 120 was more a product of the surface than it is the horse. But that said, having watched Keeneland pretty much every race, the whole meet, and the opening day at Churchill Downs, synthetic horses are, are transferring their form back to dirt very nicely. So for him... It, with me, it's going to be a matter of price. If he drifts up off that 12 to 1 line, which I think is possible, uh, I get more interested. If he drips, drifts down, I'm going to lose some interest. But he's definitely an enigma in this race in my eyes. Yeah, I have him at 15 to 1 on my line, so pretty close. Uh, he's one of those horses with a common uh, person's name and his horse name. So you wonder how that's going to factor in some of the uh, unsophisticated money that gets bet in the Kentucky Derby. Maybe that's uh, we're making too much of that, but we have seen that phenomenon play out in some prior years. Um, as far as his form goes, I agree with a lot of the points that you made, Craig. Um he did look like he really relished the surface last time. He was just moving very fluidly over that synthetic course at Turfway. But I will say, I thought he ran better than the results indicate in his two prior starts on dirt at fairgrounds. You see the red color-coded pace figures in the running lines for both the LeCompte and the Risen Star, and he made early moves to break those races open, uh, challenging for the lead at the top of the stretch before closers uh, swallowed him up in the late stages each time. But I, I thought he was somewhat against the flow each of those races and actually ran pretty well, maybe somewhat better uh, than the speed figures indicate. And also, that Risen Star has turned out to be a pretty strong race. Uh, it was a 14-horse field, and I think you'll want to take note of some of these horses that have had success in large fields before navigating traffic situations, and Two Fills has definitely done that without much issue. Uh, I thought he sliced through the pack and made a really nice middle move uh, in that Risen Star before getting a little bit leg-weary at the end, but he just has the kind of running style that I really like for the Kentucky Derby, a horse that has tactical speed, but it's not going to be so far off the pace that he's got to make up a lot of ground, and when the speeds start to to fade around the far turn. These are the horses that make those early moves to lead at the quarter pole. And Tufil strikes me as the kind of horse that could be leading this field into the stretch. We'll see what happens after that. But if he is as good as that synthetic performance last time out suggests, he's a win candidate in this race. And we'll see what kind of price he is. But I agree with you, Craig. If he's double digits, uh, he's one that I could get very interested in here. Yeah, and even though that apostrophe in his name bugs the crap out of me, uh, I don't know why I mentioned it on Twitter. I'm not sure what that's doing there. But yeah, the Phil's thing worries me as far as taking money. That would be the one thing that could drive his price down. In the end, we'll get to our picks later. He didn't quite make my cut for the top eight, but uh, for the top four. But he was definitely one of the horses I was considering. And Greg, I'm just going to take a pause here and and discuss a factor that I know a lot of people consider heavily in their derby handicapping, and that is workouts. And I think that we're transitioning to a horse that has gotten a lot of buzz lately based on workouts. Do you watch the derby trading sessions? Do you factor in the workouts? Or is that just not something that, well, I know it's not something that you factor heavily in your normal handicapping. So do you change that for the derby or do you just kind of view that as a lot of noise that's worth ignoring? 
No, you know, the only thing I really look for is works that get kind of negative reviews and, and I'll go and watch those. And for some reason, like we'll talk about more when we get to Derma Sotagake. Uh, I watched his work because I saw a lot of positive and negative come out of his work. So I'll have my own opinions on that. But for the most part, I would expect all of these horses to be working well. And if they're not, it's a problem. If they are, that's where they should be. So I don't give extra credit for working well. Yeah, I like to have some familiarity with how these horses have worked in the past. I'm going to shape strong opinions uh, that I'm going to use in my handicapping based on their workouts leading up to this Kentucky Derby. Like I've seen a verifying get a lot of positive buzz based on his workouts leading into this Kentucky Derby. But if you've watched verifying train before, and I remember him all the way from last year at Saratoga, he is just a really strong workhorse. I mean, he looks like a million bucks in the morning. So it's not a big surprise to me that he's training well into the Kentucky Derby. So I don't like to put too much stock into that kind of stuff. Um, I will say one of the more impressive workouts that I saw, even though it didn't generate as much buzz, was the workout that Two Phils turned in at Hawthorne last week. Uh, you could find some video of that on social media, and he really finished powerfully just under his own, uh, without any encouragement. So um, I'm not that familiar with how Two Phils usually trains, so I don't want to put too much stock in that. But if we're talking about impressive workouts, I did want to at least mention that, and we're going to continue discussing that factor as we move on to the next runner in the field confidence game because Craig he is bucking a lot of history here coming into the Kentucky Derby off a 70 day layoff he last ran towards the end of February in the Rebel Stakes this was not a layoff that was initially in the plans he just according to his trainer Keith DeSormo needed some extra time to recover from that really hard effort in the Rebel and they just could not quite get him ready in time to make a final prep so instead they've gone the route of putting him through some really rigorous morning training sessions, including a kind of unorthodox one-mile workout about uh, two and a half weeks ago leading into the Kentucky Derby. Also had a really stiff five furlong drill the other day that I know some people were going gaga over. How do you weigh those two factors, Greg? A horse that looks like he's doing well, but also has some negatives because there's a reason they didn't run him in the last seven weeks. Yeah, it's, um, I, I'm not a fan of this horse. He better be working well. I mean, how else is he going to be ready for this race off of a 70 day layoff? Uh, that just seems like not ideal to me. Uh, he does at least have some foundation. He ran several times as a two year old, which is good to see. But, uh, this is one of the cases I, I'm not afraid to buck history because that's when you get paid if you think you have a good opinion and you're right. Oftentimes, people will just keep betting that history until it gets proven wrong. But this horse really isn't for me. Even his Rebel, I mean, it was a good race. It was back in February, but it was by far his career best race. It was over a sloppy track. It was in a race where he got a an absolutely fabulous setup. He was running mid-pack behind a fast pace, was able to work out a trip from there. Uh, hold off Red Route 1, who's just okay. I mean, he's not a, he wasn't able to make the field. Uh, he won a race at Oakland last week, but uh, I'm just not that high on those horses. Maybe some people are. It wouldn't matter what his workouts are. I, I just have a hard time thinking he can come off this long of a layoff going into what's the most grueling race on our calendar and get the job done. Yeah, and then there's the additional factor of that Rebel victory coming over a sloppy track that he clearly loved, and his prior form over fast tracks just doesn't nearly measure up to what's required to be competitive in this race, and maybe he's just a horse that's moving forward at the right time, but if he was doing so well, wouldn't they have run him in a final prep? So I just have questions about that, and also when I look at him physically, especially watching these workouts, what really stands out to me is that he's a lighter-bodied horse that moves kind of like a turtle of horse and that says to me maybe he's the kind of horse that is just built to really love a sloppy sealed track so um i have some concerns about confidence game and i i wonder if he's some horse a horse the kind of horse that might take some money off that workout buzz Let's move on to the number five, Tappet Trice, the first of three Todd Pletcher trainees in this race. And Todd Pletcher definitely coming into this Kentucky Derby holding a very strong hand, arguably a stronger hand than anybody else. And Tappet Trice, definitely one of the major contenders that I know a lot of people have become a fan of along this Derby trail. And Greg, we've talked about this horse a lot, especially in the aftermath of his Tampa Bay Derby and Bluegrass scores, showed some concerning tendencies in that Tampa Bay Derby when he sort of disengaged 
disengaged from the rider's cues midway through the race, had to be hard ridden to get back into the bridle, but it ultimately uh, unfurl that long loping stride through the stretch to power through and mow down that field. Uh, last out in the bluegrass, I saw that uh, Luis Saez was far more aggressive in the middle stages of that race to get him into contention by the time they moved on to the back stretch. So uh, he was already in position uh, to, to grind down the leaders in the late stages. I'm just wondering what kind of trip is he going to work out in this race? Because it's a little tough to make that early move in the first half mile of the Derby when you've got 19 horses ahead of you. That source was a really tough call for me. And I'll be honest, I assumed when I opened up the past performances that I was not going to care for him uh, based on the, the problems he's had early outside of the bluegrass. Um, he hasn't run a particularly fast race yet, though his speed figures are getting better and better every time. The more I watched, the more I sided with, I, I think this horse is a pretty strong contender in this race. Uh, he's The distance obviously shouldn't be a problem for him. Um, the two concerns I have are, one, the price. He's the second choice on the morning line. Uh, I, I don't doubt that's what's going to happen, given the connections. Todd Pletcher, Luis Saez, who's been riding crazy good of late. Um, and he always rides well, but it seems like he's been really hot, particularly in big races lately. And the other concern is, even though he did show that in um, presence early, where he was able to move up, get into the race quicker than he had before, he's never been in a race with a particularly fast pace. It could help him. It could hurt him. It's one of those, it's just tough to say because he hasn't done it so far. A lot of times people just assume because a horse comes from off the pace, a, a fast pace is going to be a good thing. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It, it's possible that he just can't keep up and he drops 25 lengths off or 20 lengths back. But given what I've seen and the direction he's moving, the fact that he seems to be improving, I tend to lean towards the side that he's going to run a big race on Saturday. Yeah, Craig, I think he definitely has the raw talent to do that. And I'm not going to argue with anybody that says he's the most naturally talented horse in this race. And when you watch him come through the stretch of that uh, Tampa Bay Derby, I mean, the way that he's just taking one stride to everybody's two, I mean, the extension on this guy is really impressive. And he, he runs like the kind of horse that's going to want every bit of distance. I mean, he arguably has a better profile for the Belmont Stakes than the Kentucky Derby, as much of a cliche as that is. I think he's the kind of horse that Todd Pletcher has to be thinking in the back of his mind. If the Derby doesn't work out, I've got a really really strong contender for the Belmont Stakes. But, you know, Craig, I still have that question that I kind of posed. I mean, he, if you watch his races, he is a horse that, while he has gotten within a few lengths of the leader after a quarter mile or a half mile, it's those first 10 strides out of the gate or five strides out of the gate He's always last. I mean, he's just, he, he doesn't always break slower than the other horses, but he's just takes a stutter step. He's slow to get into stride. I mean, based on his prior form, he's going to be 20th with, uh, you know, five, 10 strides out of the gate, unless somebody else has a disaster at the start. So I just wonder, how is he going to get into any kind of forward position after that with 20 horses in the race, especially breaking from post five? Maybe they can get to the outside or make an early move, but then you have to go wide. I just, I just wonder how this trip is going to work out for him, but I don't doubt what you said about his talent because he's definitely good enough to win this race. Yeah, it's a tough call, and likely I wouldn't bet him because if he's 5-1, to one, I think the, the concerns you pose are legitimate. I just also look at it the other way, that if the pace is fast like we suspect, he's the one horse that I am very confident will be making up a lot of ground in the stretch. It is going to largely depend on what happens before that, though, with how much ground he does have to make up. He's got another Todd Pletcher trainee drawn right to his outside, the number six Kings Barnes. And Craig, I have a sneaking suspicion that we're going to be on the same page about this horse. Uh, yes, he has upside, three for three in his career. He's won his last two by open lengths, uh, as easy as you could please, but... I feel like this horse could have a rude awakening coming to him in this derby, just based on uh, what he faced last time out in Louisiana. Yeah, I'm not a fan of this horse. I mean, I wouldn't be rich strike shocked if he won, but I would be pretty shocked. He has yet to run a fast race. His highest was a 105 time form US speed figure. Um, that was one that got the pace designation. So, and all that did was basically make sure we didn't knock him off that 105. 
Uh, it was a slow race in the Derby, largely because of the pace. Uh, what's more concerning to me is the horses who were shown behind him in his wins. I mean, a horse named Mikey's Bananas, who I couldn't tell you a thing about. I've already forgotten that race. Uh, Disarm, who's in this field and we'll get to later, but whose chances I don't think much of. So, um uh, a friend of ours, Chuck Simon, uh, he's been on this this show before with me. Uh, he posted PPs of Kings Barnes and a similar Todd Pletcher horse, Materiality. And the PPs are almost just staggering how similar they are. Uh, basically mirror image of, of each other. And I know history doesn't always repeat itself, but it, it was such a thing. And Materiality didn't run well at a... Pretty short price if memory serves in the Derby. In fact, I don't think he ever ran again. And I, I just wonder if Kings Barnes is really going to be able to handle with hit him based on the lack of experience he's had so far. Yeah, I'll name another one that had a very similar profile for Pletcher coming into the Derby that a lot of people forgot. Uh, Magnum Moon, a horse that was undefeated as a three-year-old coming in. I forget. I don't think he had raced as a two-year-old. Uh, he took a lot of money, I think, in the 2018 Derby. Uh, got a disaster trip, trip. I think he wound up maybe last or second to last. So experience matters in this race and horses that have not faced a lot of adversity in their races uh the derby can be a tough race for them so i i agree with you about king's barnes i think he's uh it's going to be difficult for him to get the kind of trip that he's looking for in here yeah and i think we should mention he's going to take some money with that undefeated record todd pletcher and i think that's why we're so down if he was one of these that was listed 50 to 1 on the morning line maybe i'd give him a look but i would still be skeptical of him winning to his outside is the number seven, Reincarnate. And I mean, it, he's 50 to one on the official morning line. I think that's a little high. I, I, on my line, I have him 20 to one, uh, which I, I, I think is a little more realistic. Um, this is a horse, another one that has early speed. We talked about him with regard to his potential placement uh, in the pace situation. And you know, with Craig, I think you do have to factor in the jockey in this situation, John Velasquez, who has had a lot of success being aggressive in the Kentucky Derby. He's also a jockey that knows how to win the Kentucky Derby. Uh, he's crossed the wire first in the Derby on four different occasions, uh, three official victories. Obviously, the Medina Spirit result was taken away, but you'd have to imagine imagine he's going to be trying to pull off a similar feat here with reincarnate when i saw that morning line i thought this was one of the typos to be honest i thought maybe they crossed up him and jace's road who was 15 to 1 and was later fixed he's not going to be 50 to 1 i, I much more agree with your line just because of johnny velasquez uh I don't particularly like the horse in this race. I think he had every chance to beat Angel of Empire last time. Uh, that horse dusted him without much fanfare. I mean, without any problem at all. Uh, but I do agree with you. I think that he's probably, and we talked about it in the pace, he's one of the horses who's likely to go and try to set the pace. Beyond that, I have a hard time getting to this horse. I've seen a lot of people that like him because of that speed angle, but I just didn't see the ability when I watched those races in the Rebel and the Arkansas Derby. He had a tough trip in the Rebel, and a lot of people liked him. I, I think I, I used him on my tickets for sure when I played a pick four or pick five that day. But I just think he didn't deliver, and I'm not sure where his race would be in his PPs that could show him winning this one. Yeah, it's hard to get past that Arkansas Derby performance. I mean, he got a great trip that day and just couldn't capitalize on it. Uh, and, and he's also a horse that he's not that fast. I, I know that he showed 22 and change speed in the sham, but that's a situation at Santa Anita that I know you could talk more about, but I think there's a big run-up going the mile, and you tend to see some fast opening fractions there. The pace figures for that race, the sham, they're actually not that fast. And... Uh, also, those California prep races, especially the ones early in the season, those were that were dominated by Bob Baffert. I know they got some big speed figures. Looking back, I think there are some questions about the quality of those races based on how horses did when they shipped. Uh, so uh, Reincarnate would have to show the kind of form that we haven't yet seen out of him if he were to win a race like this. But uh, he will be prominent in the early stages. I'm pretty confident about that. Yeah, and just to, to your point, I actually had somebody write to me on Twitter about his uh, fast opening quarters at both Del Mar and Santa Anita. And before I even looked, I assumed they were one-mile races because both of those tracks use very long run-ups. Um, I forget the exact number. So it's somewhere between 180 feet and 210 feet. So take those fractions with a grain of salt. It's one of the cases where using the pace figures will, will 
tell you a lot more than using the raw times. The number eight is Mage, another horse coming into this Kentucky Derby off three prior starts, another horse who did not run during his two-year-old season. So kind of like Kings Barnes, he's got some history to buck in this race. Uh, Mage, though, Craig, he's overcome some adversity and has shown talent doing so. We saw that in the Florida Derby last time when... Yes, the trouble was of his own making, breaking slowly, but he made a really eye-catching move around the far turn to basically rocket from last to first in the span of a quarter mile, going right past Forte at that point in the race. And yes, he got run down by that horse in the late stages, but uh, that was a big step forward from, an, uh, from a performance standpoint for Mage. He just has to show that he can actually break out of the gate more alertly because when you get left in a race like the Kentucky Derby, especially when you're a horse that's looking to be more forward, it can be pretty disastrous. Yeah, I this horse is very talented. I mean, we saw it in his debut. I, I'm almost sure we talked about it on the pace cast. He kind of ran that big number, even though it was a big price. He slipped by the betters that day, but he ran a very good race in the Fountain of Youth, uh, Youth, I thought, despite finishing fourth because of trouble of his own making. And similar in the Florida Derby, and uh, he comes in with just three races, doesn't get out of the gate too well. This is a horse I was actually hoping would skip this race and go to the Preakness, uh, give him some more time, uh, maybe not throw him to the Wolves quite so fast. So even though I fully admit the talent is there, uh, he's not for me given his lack of experience and his troubles at the gate. Next up are two of the California-trained participants in this race, uh, and we're going to talk about them uh, together since they're drawn right next to each other in the past performances. First up is the number nine, Skinner, and he was the last one to get into this field, Craig, uh, with the uh, unfortunate defection uh, last week of, uh, of Wild on Ice. Skinner was able to get into this race, and... Uh, he definitely belongs in here. I mean, he's a contender based on speed figures, form. He's run well in those preps out in Southern California. Uh, if you look at the time from U.S. race ratings, and I did want to talk about this as we go through this race, you know, race ratings aren't something that we talk about that often on this podcast. But according to the race ratings, those California preps, especially the Santa Anita Derby, were the highest quality of any from a class standpoint coming into this race. And I kind of understand why, just based on some of the speed figures that horses had run on the way into that race last time. And Skinner, I mean, he's gotten some wide trips. He was wide too back in the San Felipe and route to that third place finish wide again last time in the Santa Anita Derby. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why his connections have chosen to make this jockey switch to Juan Hernandez from Victor Espinoza. So there are definitely some things to like about Skinner. There are. I, I was glad to see him draw into the field. I, I think those races in Southern California are good races. The one concern I have is the lack of depth. They weren't your typical fields. and I shouldn't say typical, but they weren't the small fields that we often see in some of the big races in Southern California where you get four or five horses. Kind of what we saw early in the prep season where we had a Bob Baffert intramural race. Uh, they did have bigger fields, but I don't think there was a whole lot of depth to them. I think you could narrow the contenders down pretty quickly to three, maybe four horses at most in the last couple. So for me, that's a little bit of a concern. But I do think Skinner is going to get some pace. I, I think he's going to be coming late. I, I don't want to totally dismiss him. He's going to be a big price. I do like the rider upgrade, which might sound a little silly, given as much as Victor Espinosa's won the Derby at least a few times. I, I forget the exact number, but he's won it uh, for Bob Baffert probably three or four times, if memory serves. And... Uh, but in this case, I don't think he's riding very well, and I don't think he fits this horse as well. So I think Juan Hernandez is a bit of an upgrade. He's been riding well, but I I'm kind of torn on the California races, but of the, the horses coming in, I actually prefer this one because he's going to be a much bigger price. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how that works out. I actually, on my line, have Skinner and Practical Move at very similar prices, and I... I uh, we'll see how they bet this race. To me, Skinner at 20 to 1 just looks too appealing for people to resist. So we'll, we'll see if he takes more money than that. I kind of expect that he will. Um, but I'm a little concerned about the 10 furlongs for him, Craig. And I know that runs counter to a lot of the narrative around this horse being a son of Curl. And I know a lot of people are looking forward to him getting a mile and a quarter. 
But when I watch him run, I don't see a mile and a quarter horse per se. I mean, he makes these big moves around the turn and is often flattening out at the end of his races. We saw that twice in a row, especially last time in the Santa Anita, hand, the Santa Anita Derby. I mean, he got there like he was going to win the race and just couldn't quite seal the deal in the final furlong. And he, he, even though he's a son of Curlin, there's a lot of sprint pedigree on the damn side. And when I look at him physically, he's a horse that isn't as rangy as some others in this field, I get the sense he's more of a miler type. And maybe I'm splitting hairs a little bit with that because a lot of these horses aren't really bred to go a mile and a quarter. Um, but, you know, I know, there's this idea that he's a horse that's going to improve with this distance. And I'm not sure that I necessarily agree with that. Um, the pace, though, could help him if it does heat up the way that I think it might. So uh, he's one that I would consider. But um, I'll be interested to see what price he is because I think his odds to win this race are probably around 15 to 1. And I I could see a scenario where he goes off shorter than that. Yeah, I think I mentioned something similar in a response to one of your tweets or a reply you gave where basically what I said was he's got a little hang in him uh, is, and maybe it's the distance. So I agree with you. I guess you could look at the last race and say maybe that hang came because he lost so much ground around both turns. But I would also say, isn't he likely to do that in the Derby as well? I mean, when you're coming from behind, there's a very good chance you're going to lose ground. Now, as we move on to the number 10 horse, Craig, you've already tipped your hand a little bit uh, on practical move that maybe you're not the biggest fan of him. As the speed figure maker, aren't you supposed to be respecting this horse? I mean, he's coming in as the consistently fastest horse in the race with two of the top speed figures in the field. I mean, with the weight adjustment turned on, 118 and 120, final time numbers in those races of 120 and 121. So, I mean, practical move has run faster than almost every other competitor in this Kentucky Derby. However, he's gotten perfect trips to do it. Is that what you're holding against him here? Because sometimes horses like this that get perfect trips in the preps doesn't always work out that way on Derby Day. Yeah, that's that's a big part of it for me. He's obviously a good horse. I, I've had people ask me a lot about the speed figures. I had no problem with the speed figures. My assistant did some of them. I think I did one of the races for some reason. I could be wrong on that. But we always check each other's work and neither one of us had any questions on it. My problem is, where is this horse going to be situated early? He's been up close in most of his races. Uh, they didn't feature a lot of pace until the last one, and he's never going to get a better trip than he did in that Santa Anita Derby. I'm envisioning a scenario where this horse is sitting 10th, 11th, and I'm just not sure he has the kind of finishing kick that's going to get the job done from there. Yeah, it's funny. I was talking about this horse on Derby Watch with Brad Free, who's obviously uh, dialed into the California circuit. And he was saying to me, like, I know every speed figure maker has the Santa Anita Derby as one of the fastest preps, as just a very fast race in general for this crop. He's like, I just don't buy it. You, just looking at how bunched these horses were at the finish, some of the also rans behind them. It just, it just feels like a fast number for everybody, maybe except practical move. And, uh, he was kind of looking at this as a horse to downgrade, which is a little surprising. You tend to, you know, think of Brad as somebody that might favor the West Coast horses. But uh, I, I, I tend to agree with him on that. Just looking at that Santa Anita Derby, it's hard for me to get too excited about the horses coming out of that race, especially given the trip the practical move got. And he is the kind of horse that can make his own good trips. But I do want to make a sort of a nuanced point about him. Um, when you watch his last two races... Focus on the starts, and he is a horse that is not the quickest out of the gate, and this is something that nobody really talks about, but when they make that first jump out of the gate, he sort of takes this stutter step, he like crouches down a little bit, and then moves forward, and he's gotten off about a length slowly in both the San Felipe and the Santa Anita Derby, and that concerns me when he starts to do that every time for a horse that does want to be somewhat forwardly placed in this race. He wants to be in that second flight, getting that stalking trip, so especially if breaking right smack dab in the middle of the pack. If he breaks a length slowly, that could be real trouble for him. So just, just a slight negative on practical move. I mean, look, he's a horse that I think could be every bit of that 10 to 1, and he's got some of the best speed figures, so maybe we're not supposed to be knocking him, but um, I, I just have too many concerns. Now, speed figures are earned in large part. I mean, it's how fast you are, but it's also the trips you got. And if you think like I do that he's not going to get anywhere near that trip, you would naturally think his speed figure is going to decline. And that's what I see in here. And don't get me wrong, I don't have any questions about that speed figure. I think there were three or four routes run on that day. 
uh, from some pretty good horses. The other races have held up. It, it's just more the circumstances where I don't think he's going to be able to repeat those numbers. Yeah, notice uh, neither of us really brought up the pedigree. I know that's the reason that a lot of people don't like Practical Move because he's bribed packed by Practical Joke. I don't really care about the pedigrees too much at this stage of the game. I mean, I'll mention it uh, with a few horses as a very minor factor, but I, I care more about looking at these horses physically, what they've done, and practical move. I mean, he's a, a big, rangy, robust horse who, I mean, if he gets nine furlongs, he probably can get ten, but I have other concerns about him. Let's move on to the number 11, Disarm, and some big prices uh, the next two, Craig, that we'll talk about. Uh, Disarm, just not as fast as some others in this field. He was a late addition getting into this race, qualifying in the Lexington, just barely doing so uh, and getting up for a distant third in that race. Personally, I haven't liked any of his races that much, and uh, I don't view him as one that's getting better on the way in. Yeah, somebody asked on Twitter the first toss, and he was mine. I'm not saying he's the worst horse in this field. I just don't like him at all in this spot. He was, he ran into Lexington. It'll be three weeks just to get into this race. Uh, he didn't even run particularly well that day. He was third behind pretty good horses in first mission and Arabian Lion, but neither one of those two were in the field, and, and I just don't see the quality there for him. I don't like the, the quick turnaround. I know three weeks wasn't quick a quick turnaround all that long ago but it is now and it just seems like they wanted to be in the race more so than win it with this particular horse yeah and he's a horse uh, another one of these that's generated some workout buzz uh steve asmussen joel rosario he could take some money in this race and i agree uh, he, he's not for me uh the number 12 is jace's road i think another horse that i expect to be a pretty easy toss for the both of us craig uh, just a horse that wants to be forward but seems like there are other naturally faster horses in this field. I know the connections think that he can be forward in this race, and some have even hypothesized that he's going to try to be forward as a, a sort of a rabbit for his uh, stablemate, uh, uncoupled stablemate, Angel of Empire, who has the same owner and trainer. But I just don't see it happening because he's just not naturally fast enough to get that kind of trip. No, I agree. I, I think if memory serves, we both liked them in the Louisiana Derby because yeah. we thought it was a race right for the pickings where he could go to the front end. Now, maybe it was a case of the connections being ultra conservative because they wanted to get points just to make it into the race. And, and that was further bolstered when I, I saw the, the connections tweeting out after how excited they were just that they made it in, assuming they were going to get there, which they did. Uh, this horse isn't for me. I don't want to spend too much time talking about a 50 to one shot. He's not fast. He doesn't have speed figures that can win this race. And he frankly has the worst possible running style. A, a horse who likes to be forward, who isn't that fast. Up next, another big price, uh, Sun Thunder. And, you know, Craig, there, there are a couple things I want to say about this horse. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this is one that you probably don't like that much. But maybe I shouldn't put words in your mouth. Um, he's just not that fast on speed figures. Uh, they're putting blinkers on for the first time in this race. Uh, that's generally a desperation move that you don't like to see ahead of the Kentucky Derby. I will say that Sun Thunder was against a bad pace situation two back in the Louisiana Derby. Um, it really just got the worst of it. I mean, covered up in traffic. He wanted to do more than he was allowed to do, only got clear when the race was basically over. So, I mean, we, we've downgraded a lot of horses out of the Louisiana Derby. I wouldn't downgrade him coming out of that race. Um, the problem is he, he was beaten by some fellow rivals in here in the bluegrass last time. But once again, it's not like that pace was that fast, and he was sort of covered up in traffic, never really got to make that early move that he likes to make. I think this horse is better than his last two results, and I respect the performance that he put forth in the Risen Star. Um, he's just going to need the trip to work out, and I don't know if it's going to, because uh, he does like to make that mid-race move, and it can be hard to launch that move from the back of the pack around the far turn of the derby when you have so many horses ahead of you. Just that kind of wall of horses that you see when you watch the head-on of the far turn of the Run for the Roses, but... Uh, I feel like this horse has a much better chance than some others that are going to be in that 30 to 50 to one range. Yeah, I don't dislike this horse. He, as a matter of fact, he's like the prototype for the horse you mentioned before with a good late, late pace figure. He's going to drop out of the race, hope for a fast pace, make one run. He's going to be passing a lot of tired horses. It's just a matter of how many he's able to pass. And he's one that I'll definitely be using in lower halves of like trifectas and superfectas that 
what's almost assuredly going to be a huge price. Yeah, I didn't include Sun Thunder in my picks or anything like that, but I, I just wanted to to give him the mention as that that kind of trifecta, superfecta horse, and I'm glad to hear that you uh, are kind of on the same page with that, Craig. The number 14 is Angel of Empire, and I think we're getting into some major contenders here uh, after uh, discussing some big long shots. Angel of Empire is going to be the shortest price of the Brad Cox trainees in this race. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty much uh, determined. Uh, and this horse is definitely coming in in great form. I mean, some people thought that his uh, Risen Star was a fluke when he upset that race two back at odds of 13 to 1. But I know that sort of you and I evolved on that over time. And I had made some points when we were handicapping the Arkansas Derby that when you kind of you know, take a microscope or put on your night vision to watch that Risen Star, um, there were some points points of trouble that he had to overcome in that race. And he also rallied in a large field through traffic. So attributes that you like to see a horse have moving on to a race like the Kentucky Derby. And he took that kind of step forward that you would want to see last time in that Arkansas Derby, showing some better tactical speed to not be so far outrun in the early stages, making that early sustained move around the far turn, something that the closers have to do in the Kentucky Derby if they're going to have a chance. And I wouldn't be surprised if he has yet another step forward in him. No, he's a good horse. He was definitely on my contender list. Uh, maybe we're a little biased. I know I think we both picked him on top for that Arkansas Derby. And not only did he deliver, he delivered emphatically. I mean, winning that race by over four lengths. Improved his speed figure once again, something he's done every single time out, which is always a good sign for three-year-olds. So uh, I just, I think he's in great form. The only one small knock I have on him involves the time form US pace projector and where he is. And he's shown tactical speed in the past. I think that was one of the things we liked it, that he was actually able to make a move in the risen star. But I do worry that he's going to get shuffled out of it pretty far in this field. It, it's hard when you look through the horses one by one to find horses shown in front of them in the pace projector who actually you could argue with and say, no, they'll probably be behind them. I think the pace projector is pretty accurate. So I think he would have to be used a little more than what he has been used uh, before. That said, maybe he's good enough. His speed figures are not too far from the best in this field. And like you said, he's coming in in good form. Definitely a contender for me with that one slight negative caveat. Yeah, Craig, I've seen some people bring up that point that I'm going to push back on a little bit. I mean, I don't I don't get, see why that's a negative. I mean, to me, it wasn't a big surprise to see his placement on the pace projector. He's a closer. I mean, I, I, I guess I haven't seen this tactical speed that other people are saying that he possesses. He just comes from off the pace in all of his races. Um, so, I mean, I kind of expect him to be 14th, 15th, 16th early. That makes sense to me. I mean, what I do like about Angel of Empire is that even though he's been a little further off it in his races, he launches that move at the half mile pole and doesn't peter out. I mean, he is still running with power through the wire despite starting that move four furlongs early in both the Risen Star and the Arkansas Derby. So to me, that says this is a horse with stamina who can really finish. So uh, I like that about him. And you know, the way that we've talked about this, I think this Derby pace is going to be a lot faster than some people are uh, hypothesizing. So maybe being that far back in the early stages is not going to be such a negative. We'll see how that all plays out. Let's move on to the number 15, Forte. And Craig, uh, this is the consensus favorite in this race. I think people have basically uh, agreed that he's going to be the favorite. Uh, we can debate what price he's going to be. Uh, he's three to one on the track morning line. I've got him seven to two on my line, kind of considering actually going up to four to one rather than going lower. It just feels like this is a much more competitive race than just conceding it to Forte as a heavy favorite. And I, as I look around social media or a lot of people I respect, uh, a lot of people seem to be viewing it that way, that maybe Forte is not a horse that looks that formidable against this field. So that starts to make me think maybe he's not going to be as strong a favorite as a lot of people expect him to be. So maybe the prices on some of these other horses are depressed a little bit. We'll see how that works out. Sometimes, you know, if you base these opinions too much on social media, you can get into trouble because there's a lot of other money that gets bet into the Kentucky Derby, people that are not on Twitter and other things like that. Um, but I do agree with the general sentiment that this race is not all about Forte by any stretch. No, I mean, the first thing uh, as a speed figure guy I'm going to look at is the speed figures. He's competitive with everybody else. Uh, he doesn't have an advantage. And in fact, quite a few have run faster than what he has in here. So 
that's never the horse. If this was a regular race on a Thursday afternoon that I'm going to want to take as a favorite. So I sure as heck aren't going to want to take them on the Kentucky Derby when I'm looking to, to make a score. And for me, that's what the Derby's about. We only get this chance one time a year. There are ways you can make a score with the favorite winning. We've seen it with some crazy prices before, but uh, in the underneath slots. But I just don't think Forte is that strong of a favorite. He's a very vulnerable favorite, in my opinion. The biggest negative for me is that he was running fast races as a two-year-old. He won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile with an above average or average to above average 115 figure. He pretty much dominated the, the two-year-old crop. He's looked good coming back, but he's yet to improve that speed figure. And for me, that's a big warning sign for a three-year-old. They should be getting faster, and he has not been. Many of the horses in this race will, and I think he's going to need to take a big step to, to get to the winner's circle. Yeah, and I think that that last point that you make about him is the real sticking point for me. You know, in the Kentucky Derby, Craig, years past, the last decade or so, usually there's a horse that's running speed figures 120 plus, you know, on the time form US scale, you know, buyers 105 plus, and that horse is just, you know, the standout, the California Chromes, the American Pharaohs, and the Justifies, and and they win because they're just faster than everybody and they're superior. Or we get those years where really nobody's run those speed figures and somebody takes a step forward and runs that Kentucky Derby winning race. Uh, And predicting who takes that step forward is the challenge in races like that or years like that. And this feels like one of those years where nobody's that standout on speed figures. And there's going to be somebody in this race that runs a career best by five points and wins. And it's just hard to look at Forte's trajectory and say it's going to be him because he was so good last Last year, and he's just kind of hit that plateau. He, he looked great in the Fountain of Youth, albeit beating a weaker field. And then the Florida Derby last time, I mean, that wasn't the strongest field either. I mean, Mage is a nice horse, and we praised him and his, his natural talent, but I mean, he had a tough trip in that race and still almost beat Forte. So I have that concern about just whether or not he's moving forward. And also, speaking of those Time Formula US race ratings, you know, I think there's this perception out there that the races Forte ran in were just the best races because Forte was in them. But, you know, the Time Formula US race rating algorithm takes all that into account. And it's not like the Fountain of Youth and the Florida Derby look particularly strong from a class perspective relative to everybody else in here, or even the Breeders' Cup Juvenile for that matter. So... I, I think that they're based on a lot of metrics that you see in Time Form US. There are some reasons to downgrade Forte. Beyond all that, Craig, I think he's going to run well here. I just don't want to bet him, if that makes sense. I, I, I'd be surprised if he's not in the top five or six because he's so reliable. He makes his own good trips. He seems like he's doing pretty well coming into this race. I just, if, if he, you know, if he's in the top five and wins, I don't need to win this derby. That's just kind of how I feel about it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. There's a lot of horses I think are that could run well in here, but I don't want to bet them. And the shorter the price, the more likely that is. And he's probably going to be the shortest of the short. I, I'm with you. I see a lot of the same, like virtually nobody on social media I've seen is picking Forte. But like you said, I, I don't know how much weight that's going to carry when you have a hundred and some thousand people at Churchill betting and A lot of people just default to the favorite. He's going to get all the hype. Uh, I think he'll probably still take, uh, I agree with your seven to two line. Um, But yeah, I don't want to bet him either. He can run well, but I I would also add that based on the speed figures, based on how he's maturing, he could run well and run fifth easily. So uh, for me, I have no problem not betting him. The number 16 is Ray's Kane, Craig. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say about this horse. I mean, he, he was visually impressive in the Gotham, got a great pace set up that day and took advantage um, in a one-turn race. I haven't seen him produce that kind of kick in a two-turn race, and it's just a little slow, so hard to build a case for him. Yeah, and it was in the mud as well. Uh, perfect setup. Uh, that race completely fell apart. He was the only one that really did any running in the end and the only one that's really done much running out of that race since then. So he's not for me. Next up is uh, one of the more debated contenders in this Kentucky Derby, the number 17, Derma Sodagake, one of the two Japanese-trained runners in this field, and definitely the one that seems to have the stronger chance of those that are in the main body of this race. Uh, Craig, this is a talented horse. 
I don't think that there's any debating that. I mean, I'm going to let you talk a little more about the UAE Derby. And we've, we've mentioned the fractions, but just how fast that race actually was, because people are going to see that 107 time form rating show up in their PPs if they have the weight adjustment on, I think a 109 if they don't have it turned on. Um, but uh, th- that doesn't really capture how he stacks up against this field or the contender, I know, due to the, the time form weight adjustment. And I'll let you talk more about that. Uh, but just... The versatility this horse shows, the the way that the Japanese have just been getting more and more sophisticated at getting these horses ready for the big days around the globe in, in better ways. And we saw them start to have success at the Breeders' Cup a couple seasons ago. It just feels like a derby win by a Japanese horse is inevitable at some point in the next decade. And maybe this year is the year. Yeah, you stole the words out of my mouth. It's going to happen. They're they're breeding too good a horse for them not to win a Kentucky Derby. The question is, when will it be? And do you want to be that guy that says, oh, you can't win. The, the Japanese horses can't win until somebody does it. Or UAE Derby horses, they, they're they over for whatever. They never run well here. It's going to happen eventually. Uh, maybe you want to get ahead of the curve. And if you do, I think this is a horse who he's the best looking UAE Derby horse I, I've seen come in. And it's not particularly close. Uh, I usually make speed figures for Dubai. It was really tough to do this year because partly because of this horse. When you pulled up the times of the dirt races that day, his race stuck out like a sore thumb. And I, I read a lot about the, the track at Maidan that day where people were saying, oh, the track was totally different for the uh, the Dubai wor- the World Cup as it was for the UAE Derby. And the more I look, the more I watch the races, I just don't buy it. I mean, they've been running that race on dirt there. They had a brief hiatus where they ran on synthetic. But they've been running these races very similarly for a long time now. And I've never seen the two races that close in times. And when I made the speed figures, Derma Sotagake ran a very fast number. I would say low 120s. I conservatively put it at 121. It, it could have been faster. Now, part of that, I don't think the World Cup was near as strong as it usually is. That race would actually get a pretty low rating for me. But it would be lower than, than the UAE Derby. So take it for what you will. But I, I think this horse is a legitimate contender. I add to that that He's fast. Uh, He draws a good outside post so he can get forward position without being suicidal, trying to make the front. If he doesn't make it, he can sit two or three wide. We've seen that that trip win before. So I think this horse is very dangerous. I did want to ask you about his workout that so many people were talking about. I watched it. uh, Didn't pay too much attention to the comments. I liked what I saw. I I didn't see anything negative there, but I'm not an expert work watcher, so I am curious what you thought about it. Yeah, I mean, I do follow uh, that account on Twitter, uh, Graham Pavey, who does, you know, uh, covers a lot of the Japanese racing uh, in English. And, uh, you know, he'll tweet out some videos of Japanese horses trading in Japan, uh, you know, their final workouts for major group one races over there. So I've watched some Japanese workouts before, and you tend to see them really put emphasis on the the final split, maybe a really fast furlong at the end of a workout or a fast quarter mile at the end after, uh, you know, gradually building up to that in the early stages of the work. Whereas American trainers tend to just want a real steady work, uh, you know, clicking off those 12s at every eighth. Um, The Japanese horses, they do it a little bit differently. It's more about the variations in speed and showing acceleration towards the end. That's what I saw happening in the Derma Sotagaki and Continuar work in company. Um, You know, he was obviously raiding off Continuar early, but they were both going very slowly in the early stage, just, just sort of a canter. And then once the work really began, or the serious part of the work, they picked up the pace. And I mean, you know, I put my stopwatch to it. I mean, I had Derma Sotagaki coming through the stretch in about 23 flat and throwing into the middle like an 11 flat eighth there. So that that kind of tracks with the way that they usually try to train these horses for the big races in Japan. Um, And, you know, people made a lot of the fact that the exercise rider was asking him for his best. Well, you see that. I mean, you know, a lot of the American training, especially in the lead up to the Derby, seems like it's more about optics than it is anything else. I mean, you you want, uh, you know, the owners, the, the people around the horse to, to think the horse is doing well. I mean, they generally are doing well. You don't want to mess anything up. Um, but it seems like there's a little more intention to getting something out of these works in a specific fashion for the Japanese horses. And also, 
a lot of the Japanese horses that we've seen come over, I don't know what it is about their trading methods, but they just seem to have more personality than a lot of the U.S. horses, or maybe the personality isn't trained out of them the way that this, it is in this country. I mean, there have been some quirky ones that have come over, like I think of Lonnie. I mean, even Crown Pride was a little headstrong. And Dermot Sodagaki, when you watch him in the morning, he's he, he's throwing his head around, looking around all the time. I mean, he's a, a very curious horse out there. And when he's not going at full speed, he can look a little ugly with the way that he's throwing that head about. But when he's at top speed, and especially in his races, he's the consummate professional. I mean, you don't see him getting rank in his races, even though he led last time and has come from off the pace in the past. I mean, it's, he's handled it all with a plum. So um, I don't expect any of the weird training or behavior that we've seen from him to be an issue on race day. And when I've watched this horse's races, Craig, I just see a horse that's learning a new lesson with every race, getting a little better with every race. And... I expect him to run well. I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that I'm sure about it or that he's the, the most likely winner of this race, but I just am getting the vibe that, that this horse is an evol a more evolved version of some of the Japanese attempts that we've seen at this race in the past, and I, and I think we're going to see a good account of him. Let's move on to number 18, Rocket Can, and the, the, the main body of this field, the last three in the outside portion of the gate. I think they're all horses that are big prices. Um, you know, and Rocket Can, Craig, he's run some decent races. Um, that Holy Bull obviously didn't come back that fast. But to his credit, he did run a little faster in his losses to Forte and Angel of Empire. I just haven't seen excuses that would make me want to upgrade him in a race like this. No, same for me. He hasn't run particularly fast. Uh, his best race was a distant second to Forte in the Fountain of Youth. Uh, when he won that Holy Bull back in February, it came back so slow, I, I almost couldn't believe it. And he's run better out of that, but not good enough to make him a contender. I I guess if people wanted to latch on for the something, I mean, his running lines don't look all that dissimilar to a horse like Country House, who wound up being elevated via, via disqualification, but he's not for me. And he's another one that's adding blinkers for the race that's uh, historically not been a successful move in the Derby and also just kind of feels like sort of desperation because he hasn't taken that step forward. So, yeah, uh, not for me in this race. The number 19 is Lord Miles, the uh, upset winner at 59 to 1 of the Wood Memorial. Uh, and, Greg, he got a pretty good trip that day uh, being forward in a race where I think you wanted to be forward I and mean, he was able to pull off the upset. It's going to be tougher to work out the, the right kind of trip from post-19 and also got to prove that race was no fluke, but even more than that, it's got to run better. Yeah, I was, I mean, obviously when he won at 59 to one, I was surprised and was wondering where that race came from. But when I did the speed figures, it's not like he ran all that much faster. He just kind of had natural progression as a three-year-old, got a nice trip and, and was able to win what was in, invariably just a slow race. It's not going to do any favors to those that, think the Wood Memorial should be a grade one because I, I don't expect any of the horses, either of the horses from that race to run well in here. And if it was one, I, I think it would be hit show much more so than the horse uh, Lord Miles who finished in front of him. But I, I think the odds will show they're both 30 to one on the morning line. I would be very surprised if they didn't both drift in opposite directions and have a pretty big gap between them. More like 20 to one and 50 to one. And the horse that's drawn in the far outside post position in the main body of the field is the number 20 Continuar, the other Japanese trained horse in this race. And I think it's been pretty well reported and established that he is the lesser of the two Japanese in here. Um, obviously, was uh, soundly defeated by Derma Sodagake in the UAE Derby. Um, they had had some closer decisions between them prior to that, but whereas Derma Sodagake has been on the way up, feels like Continuar may be on the way down. Yeah, and that workout kind of showed that. I mean, think what you will of the workout for Derma Sodagake. It was definitely better than Continuar's because he basically ran by him just like he did in the UAE Derby. Uh, no problem at all. It just looks like two horses on a different level. So if you don't think he can compete with uh, his country mate, I, I don't know how you think he could win this race. Yeah, and I think American fans will be more familiar with the trainer of Continuar than they would be of Derma Sodagake. Uh, Continuar is trained by uh, Yoshito Yahagi, who well, people will remember uh, trained 
both of those winners on Breeders' Cup Day, Loves Only You and the big price, Marsh Lorraine, who seemed uh, impossible to a lot of racing fans, but caused the upset there. So um, he's a name that we've seen be very prominent or a face that we've seen very prominent in a lot of these international meets and causing some upsets, uh, but uh, continue are still kind of hard to make based on form. And Craig, we'll go on to the three also eligible entrants. We don't want to go without mentioning them just based on what happened last year. Um, you know, we've got, I think, two big prices in uh, Cyclone Mischief and King Russell, who I don't think most people would consider as factors if they got into this race. Mandarin Hero is the one that I think you'd have to take a long look at in the off chance that there are two defections before scratch time and he's able to draw into this field because he's arguably a horse that, I mean, should be in this race just based on how well he ran in the Santa Anita Derby. If you if you want to see the best possible field assembled in the Derby, Mandarin Hero should be in the race and maybe they'll tweak the point system next year to ensure that things like this don't happen again with horses like him getting excluded. Um, but uh, we already brought up some of the concerns about that Santa Anita Derby and uh, whether we want horses out of that race. And I guess you kind of have to lump him into that conversation. You do. I, I would add that I do think he was probably best in that race. Uh, he had a rougher trip than the other two, uh, whereas Skinner was on the outside. I don't think he had a lot of excuses. Practical move had a perfect trip inside. Uh, I thought this horse ran well, but yeah, it, it would be a pretty big leap to to get him into the winner circle, particularly he would be on the far outside. Um I will say I I look at this a little bit differently than you. Obviously, he's a different case in that he's a shipper, uh, so maybe he should be in the field. He only had that one chance, but I kind of like the new tweak in the point system where horses like him and King Russell, who ran second in the Arkansas Derby, they would have been in in years past, and this year they're not because they didn't really do much in any of the other points races, and I like that it's going to maybe prod people to run their horses a little bit more. I mean, maybe it's a debate for another time. Um, I, I don't like the... I don't like the ratio is what I'm getting at. I think fourth and fifth have been given way too much credit in this point system. You can basically finish fourth twice and that equals a second. To me, that's wrong. Um, you know, horses like Sun Thunder, I mean, I, we think he's a little interesting to clunk along for a piece, but I mean, it seems like based on accomplishments, he shouldn't really be in this race for finishing fourth and fifth a couple times in the final round prep. So I think that, that the ratio of points needs to get tweaked if they're going to give points all the way down to fifth. And it's a working against some horses that achieve some second place finishes that are better than some of the accomplishments of horses that got in through other routes. So that's uh, that's my take on that. Uh, maybe, I, I guess uh, I understand why some people might disagree with that. It's, it's something that's hard to please everybody. Um, no, I agree with that. I, I have no problem with lessening points for fourth and fifth uh, uh if it was up to me it would be top three only but that's a different discussion for for maybe 2024 derby yeah, craig cyclone mischief of the horse that I, I do want to just mention because he's run fine in his last two races i thought that the rail was not the place to be on the fountain of youth day and he was right down towards the inside that day so arguably ran a little better than that third place finish would suggest and he was uh the first one to make a move into that fast pace in the florida derby last time so I mean, there are some things to like about him it just feels like another horse that maybe the derby is not the right race for him yeah, I think he was moving in the right direction. His uh, speed figure improved one point in that Florida Derby, but if you watch the trips, they were vastly different. I would imagine on speed figures that take ground loss into account, he got a much better figure. So uh, he's not, he wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility uh, given the numbers that he has run. If he got in and he's a huge price, he could be one that I would use in my uh, lower half of vertical bets. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, he, he could be twice the price of a horse like Reincarnate, and their form actually looks pretty similar. Um, and then, you know, King Russell, obviously unlikely to draw into the field, leading three defections. Uh, and he was a horse that uh, didn't earn much of a speed figure last time, to fight, despite finishing a distant second. And uh, it would be a big ask of a horse like him to be effective in this race. So, Craig? Yeah, no doubt. It's uh, we, we've got taken up more time than we usually do on this podcast, but I think the people, uh, the listeners might appreciate it that we really went in depth with all of these horses since uh, I'm sure somebody's going to have something positive to say about everybody in this field. Um, 
now that we've taken it to the end, let's get to our picks in this race. And I don't know who should go first. I'm, I'm kind of I'm curious to know who you like. I feel like we're going to have some overlap in some places of difference, which I'm glad about. Um, so um, so I don't steal your thunder. I'll give you the stage first. All right. Yeah, I'll go first. No problem. Uh I'll just mention the top four and why I put them in there. Uh, I went with Dermasota Gake. Maybe I tipped that off a little bit. I think this horse is really good. I like the word you used, inevitable, that Japan is going to win the Kentucky Derby. I think it's probably going to be sooner rather than later. And I'd rather take my swing when the price is still going to be pretty big. Now, I'm not sure we're going to get 10 to 1. I think he might get bet down a little bit off of that, maybe to 8 to 1. But I'd be surprised if he went much lower than that with the size of the field. So I I actually think based on the speed figure that I think he ran in Dubai that he may very well be the best horse, has good tactical speed, and, and I just want to take a swing with him. Uh, The others I have in behind, I went with Tappet Trice second. I just, he's the one horse I'm very confident is going to be passing horses and doing so with authority in the lane. It just depends how far back he is early and how he's uh, able to work out a trip. But the talent is there. I think he's going to run well. Skinner I have largely because of the late pace. I'm with you. You mentioned you think the pace is going to be faster than a lot of people do. And I agree. Uncertainty tends to cause paces to speed up. Um, When we have, when everybody knows who the front runners are, things tend to get a little more tame up front as they seem to see the lead. And in a case like this, where you have a lot of horses with tactical speed, I think it'll get fast. So I went with a horse like Skinner. I have a few reservations. You mentioned the distance. He's had a little hang in him, but he's going to be coming as well. And for fourth, I didn't want to leave Forte out of it totally because I, I think you put it well. I think he's going to run well. I just don't know if it's going to be good enough to win, and I don't want to take a short price on that. Well, I like this, Craig. We we only have one horse in common, which I think is is the kind of race that this is. I mean, there are so many ways to go, and you want to see some variety in these picks because it means that the money's going to be spread around, and that just makes it a better betting race. So I'm kind of glad to see that. Um, okay, so the horse that I put on top in this race, and maybe you could, uh, you know... I gave it a preview of it when I gave my staunch defense of him, um, is the number 14, Angel of Empire, um, who you mentioned the way that I'm viewing this pace, Craig. I do think it's going to heat up. He is the horse that I've seen have uh, one of the strongest finishing kicks of anybody in this field. And maybe not, you know, coming from as far back as some others. So that's why his late pace rating isn't quite as high as some others in this field, but he's just able to start that run from so far from the home and able to sustain it. So I like that for him. And, you know, I don't want to harp too much on the workouts, but I just think this horse is doing really well. Um, not being that familiar with the way he trains in the past, he just feels like a happy horse right now. And Flavian Pratt, certainly happy to have him on uh, on his back in a race like this. So I just think Angel of Empire makes a, a ton of sense in this race uh, from my vantage point. And I, I do believe he's going to be around eight to one. And I think he actually has a better chance of winning than that. Um, so uh, Angel of Empire is my top pick in this race. Um, my second pick is two fills, uh, who I just think is a horse that is has the kind of running style that will put him in the mix in the Kentucky Derby. He makes that early far turn move to potentially lead at the quarter pole or the eighth pole. And that's generally something that works in the Derby. If you can sort of break free at that point in the race, you know, maybe you can get brave at the end and make something happen. And I think two fills is the kind of horse that can, um, you know, make his own trip in a race like this. So um, we'll see what price he is, but um, I definitely like the way that he's coming into this race and think he's going to run well. I do have your top pick in there for third, Craig, uh, the number 17, Derma Sotagake. I mean, we're in agreement with him. I I, I almost put him on top, um, just kind of had that uncertainty about what price that he would be. Um, but I really do think he's going to run well in here. And my fourth pick is the number one hit show. Um, I wanted to include a big price that I think could pick up the pieces because I do have that view that there are some horses that you want to upgrade in the trifectas and superfectas. And I think he's one of those candidates that could pick up some pieces and is moving in the right direction, is going to like the distance. And some people might overlook him just due to the rail draw, but I don't think it's that much of a detriment for hit show. So uh, 14-3-17-1 for me uh, in uh, the Kentucky Derby. And... <laughs> We we covered a lot of ground on this podcast, Craig, but I'm glad we did because it's such an interesting race to discuss and handicap. 
It is, and I, I'm not surprised our picks varied. All of the horses you mentioned, I, I said earlier, I think there were eight horses. I had to narrow it down. It, it was just basically, you know, splitting hairs on, on who it was going to be because I, I think it's a wide open race. Uh, it's a race I don't want to take overly short prices. So maybe in my top four, I, I mentioned Forte and Tapa Trace. I probably won't bet them at all. I'll probably be looking at others. Uh, DRF, I mentioned they make us send our picks in early. We had to send them in this morning. It's Tuesday as we record. Uh, so before we do our preview on Thursday, I, I do reserve the right to change my selections. Uh, it wouldn't be much. It, it would be something close to this, but there's possibility things could change between now and then. But for now, uh, I'm happy with the picks, but I, I am really looking forward to this race more so than a lot of derbies in the past just because of the uncertainty same for me i mean once you develop these opinions i mean it's just uh, fun to debate it with people the anticipation just builds until uh, post time on saturday so uh really fun uh, time of the week uh, during derby week uh, uh you know once the handicapping is done to just enjoy it so looking forward to getting there and craig and i of course will discuss more about this when we do some of our stakes previews later in the week you can find all of that on drf.com and drf's youtube channel i think craig and i are going to do four stakes previews covering uh the derby the Oaks and uh, a couple of the undercard stakes at Churchill. Um, I should just mention a couple other things. Uh, you can also check out uh, DRF.com's shop where you can get PPs, uh, Player's Guide, the Clock Reports, and also I will be doing uh, betting strategies with Marcus Hirsch like I've done in past years. We're a big fan of Marcus's handicapping on this podcast, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some ideas with him. I will be going back and forth and writing, kind of writing analysis for these races, putting some tickets together so you can find out more information about that on drf.com before we go i just would say this is the week that kind of makes or breaks this like 90 percent of the people out there they don't care what we say the rest of the year they just want to know about the derby so it's one of those it's a tough race but i'm just kidding i know most of the people listening to us are, are pretty serious fans but i imagine we'll have a lot of new listeners so hopefully we uh gave out some good information it's, it's true, Craig. A, a good derby pick does uh, go a long way. So hopefully we gave out some of those on this podcast, some good ideas that you can use this weekend. Everybody, thanks so much for listening to this week's Time Form US forecast. As uh, We're recording this forecast on Tuesday. This will be the only podcast that we put out this week, but we will be back with the Time Form US Pacecast to recap the derby and everything else that goes on at Churchill next weekend. So uh, remember, you can always check out these podcasts on DRF.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Podcast, just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Form channel. Again, thanks for tuning in and make sure to catch our Derby Recap Show coming up next Tuesday.